Good morning again. I'm so glad you guys are here. Last time I did this in this room, there wasn't anybody here. Well, my name is Matt Bennett. I'm the Eastern Sales Lead for North America. And I'm going to be joined in a little bit by Corey Mulbauer, who's the R&D agronomist. On behalf of both of us, we're just excited you spend some time with us today. The title of our session is Utilizing Fertilizer Wisely. And we're going to really dial in on planter banded fertility in here. So it's a big surprise. We're going to talk about fertility in this one. All right. So many of us, fertility might be the first thing on your mind right now. It, it, it very well, right? It's right there. Fertility prices, is a, are you paying what you did for fertilizer? Are you a little bit worried about it? So the elephant in the room, we just got to get it out of the way, right? We're, just, we're going to focus on it. We're going to try to find a path to be a little bit more precise, maybe utilize a little less fertilizer to go forward. But we want to talk about it because a lot of us in this room, it's something that's on your mind, right? So we'll share a little bit of data with you today that's going to talk through where, where we are fertilizer-wise, how we buy, how we utilize. That's kind of the session, the why we're here. All right, so this is a widely shared photo. You guys have probably seen this before on social media, right? So last year this time, you could buy that bay of fertilizer for $18,000. And this year, it's 40. Ouch. And you thought it was expensive already, didn't you? You know what's funny? If they're gonna raise the price of fertility, it'd be nice if they'd come out with some new feature, right? Maybe like heated, cooled, massaging seats, something like that. Don't just charge me more. How many think that the $40,000 bin of fertilizer feeds your crop any better than the $18,000? It doesn't, right? And the reality is, and this is an old saying, that misery loves company. So the good news is, us in the ag sector, we're not alone. All right? So and the bad news is, some of you guys have building projects on your farm, and you're like, they're getting me twice right? But think about this. This is one year, one year difference in the cost of lumber and what you could get. You guys know this already, but it's something we need to think about. So I'm going to share this chart with you. This is something that the University of Illinois from the Department of Agriculture and Economics, they put out every year. All right, so it's based in central Illinois farm ground and what they would consider highly productive. So in 2020, 2021, it was $860 an acre to produce corn. That was your cost. Now, some key things I want you to pay attention to is your fertilizer cost. You see that one right there? It was about 16% of the expense. Historically, I would stand in front of you and say your seed input and your fertility input are probably going to be really close to identical. That's been a very true statement. All right? So this is what we lived. This was passed. Now, let's go to this year. It's gone up over $200, and more than half of it is your fertilizer. So it all went up, but the fertility went from 16 to 22% while it was going up. So it's going to be much more expensive. Now, some of you, or a lot of you in this room, or definitely watching on simulcast today, don't farm highly productive soil in central Illinois. The great news is, is that you probably have a land grant or a university ag department close where you can gain that information. They probably all have it, all right? But the thing we want to point out is the fertilizer cost going up. What does this do to our ROI? Now, everyone's staring at that chart. I'm going to give you a little fact here. It's now going to cost you $1 more to produce a bushel. Let's let that sink in. So next thing we got to talk about is the complexities of status quo, what we've always done. Now, the easy button, we've all seen this, right? The easy button for fertility is this. It's a phone call, an application pass, and an invoice in the mail. Did I just describe anybody's fertility plan? It's okay. I'm not picking on you. Thing is, that might have worked. And if it has worked, good for you, right? But the idea is this cost keeps raising or going up. Can we afford to have someone apply it? The next idea is a lot of us are putting most of our fertility on in the fall, six months before the crop needs it sometimes. So we need to understand that when we talk about using fertilizer wisely, the status quo sometimes there's a little risk built in, isn't there? Right? Maybe a little bit more risky move than what we're used to. 
I'll introduce you to this guy. Does anybody know who this is? Yeah, Joey Chestnut. Joey Chestnut, and believe it or not, this is news to me. There is a national hot dog eating contest that happens every year over the 4th of July, and they televise it. Have you guys seen it? This is the Michael Jordan of hot dog eating. His name is Joey Jaws Chestnut. He's a 14-time world champion, and he just set the new hot dog eating record last July, and he ate 76 hot dogs in 10 minutes. It's pretty impressive. I know some of you are looking at me right now saying, you got to shut. No. <laughs> no, I don't. The thing about this is, and let's talk about this from a fertility standpoint, all right? Joey Chestnut ate nine days worth of caloric intake. Almost 10 days, over nine days. He ate 24,000 calories in 10 minutes. Do you think Joey the Jaws Chestnut had to eat again in a couple days? Or do you think he literally went nine days without eating? Did he utilize the calories that he had? Now, I'll tell you right now, putting all your fertilizer out in the fall is a lot like Joey Chestnut. You intake or you put out all those calories, but they're not there when you need them, are they? Do you, if we're honest about it, do you think he retained much of that at all? That, look, that, that's, that's the look of a champion right there. <laughs> I want you guys to visualize that the next time you see 85% of your fertility going on the field in October. All right, that's the, that's the look of a champion right there. Now, you know, the rule in fertilizer, you put too much on, what happens to it? What was the old saying? It ends up in the ditch, doesn't it? You think some of his hot dogs ended up in the ditch? All right, we won't go there. All right, how many of us have seen this sign before? You probably have seen it at some local business, right? You know, they maybe have some little snarky sign when you go in. This is one of them, right? We offer three kinds of service, good, cheap, and fast, and you can only pick two. Now, don't we wish we knew what the, the secret was and you had all three? If you found all three somewhere in your operation, remember it, write it down. Bottle it, sell it to the person sitting next to you, right? Because it's hard to find all three of these things at the same time. The idea is you're going to give something up. And that's the way it is with fertility. So when we start talking planter banded fertilizer, you guys are going to have some objections. All right? I don't have time. The equipment costs money. I don't know how to do it. My favorite, it's messy. That's my favorite one. At the end of the day, that easy button is there for us, and we like to hit it sometimes. So as we think through this, we're going to challenge you guys a little bit, a little bit today. I'm going to invite Corey to come up here. I want you guys to realize that if your guys are successful doing the easy button, that's good, but I want you to relook at your ROI. So we're going to spend a lot of time on it. Corey's going to share five years of replicated data across three different completely farming operations. And we're going to share that with you next. So Corey, why don't you come up and join us? Thank you, Matt. Guys, what we're going to do is dive in a little deeper on uh, some data and some concepts behind our fertilizer management. What I want to start out with is, you know, I feel like farmers in general, the masses, are a little bit disconnected with the building blocks behind the system that's in place that guides the check that you write for your fertilizer every year. And like we saw in some of the economic charts earlier, it's your number one input cost other than land every year that you raise your crop. And, and I feel like there's, there's an opportunity for more involvement. But I also feel like transparency is really important. As I've studied fertilizer for a lot of years in my career as an agronomist, um, I, I don't know that farmers know all of the, all the building blocks that, that are behind that fertilizer recommendation and, and the investment there. And I just want you to think about, you know, what is your confidence level in that check that you write and it generating the best ROI possible, getting the best profit from that investment every year, um, how, what is your confidence level in that? Or, or are you kind of writing that, that blind check and, and you hope that, that your yields are there and, and that you made money with that investment? 
You see, a lot of investments, we really give it a lot of thought, and we look for a 5% return and a 6% return and a 7% return, and we're really satisfied with that, and we're really calculating that out. In fertilizer, do we have that visibility, and is that ability there to really measure what it's returning us? And I think that's a challenge today. So I feel like it's a good idea to step back and work through the building blocks of what creates the wreck that drives the amount of fertilizer that ultimately drives the size of the check you write. So we're going to talk about soil sampling strategies today. Uh, what's working the best? What are better opportunities? These are just thought-provoking things we're going to go through. We're going to talk about repeatability. What's the accuracy of that soil test? The soil test results is what ultimately drives your P, your K, your lime, a significant portion of your fertilizer investment. So is the lab results highly repeatable and highly accurate? We're going to look at some of that. Lab to lab. Do you know what lab your samples are being sent to? Do you know what the accuracy and repeatability of that lab is compared to another lab? There's a, there's a lot of options there. State universities <clears throat> are basically the foundation for where our uh, formula to calculate how much fertilizer we need comes from. They generate um, agronomy handbooks that agronomists in the fertilizer industry follow as kind of a baseline, and most of them tweak those numbers a little bit for their regions and for the farmers that they work with. But what's, what's the data behind that? How reliable are those recommendations? Um, and, and how much trust should we put in those is, is something that I want to cover a little bit. So let's go, so, go through some of this. I, I think it's a rare opportunity to relook at these things and, and understand where we're at. So first, we decided we wanted to study how accurate are we representing the fertilizer variability within a field. So the nutrient levels in the soils in our fields, how accurately are we representing that? And we thought the best way to do it is we're going to collect an intensive quantity of samples within a few fields, and we're going to use that data set to analyze traditional methods of sampling and, and see what we're missing uh, or see how accurate we are. So we did five fields uh, in 16th acre grid. So that's 16 samples, soil samples per acre, and that is one heavy load of labor to collect 798 soil samples in this one 50-acre field that you're looking at here. So we're, we're lucky and fortunate enough to team up with a company out of Indiana called Rogo Ag. Rogo is a fairly new company trying to improve the soil sampling space. There are uh, a couple of engineers out of Purdue started this company, and they've developed high-speed soil sampling equipment and highly accurate uh, soil coring equipment that's accurate to the depth that you want to pull the samples on every core and it does it with a high-speed screw, and, and uh, they can very accurately and consistently collect soil to create a more consistent and precise sample. These guys now do a lot of contract soil sampling, um, so they volunteered to be a part of this study with precision planning and to collect all the soil for us. And then uh, we, we covered the lab end of it, and we're working together to analyze the data, which we're just getting started on uh, this season. So I'm really glad to have them as part of this project. So here's just a look at, on, on your left, is that 16th acre grid where we pulled an intensive amount of samples, and we call that the truth layer. And then typical soil sampling strategies um, today are going to be some soil zones where we've got next to that where we use the soil characteristics in the field to guide where we create polygons, and then we sample within those polygons. They'd be called composite samples. We blend together, and that, that represents a polygon. 20 samples in the field for that. Same number of samples as a two and a half acre grid, which is probably the number one most common method for collecting soil. And then quite a few acres in the country, maybe a third, are something less than, or, or greater than two acres per sample. So I used a four acre grid for, for that example. And believe it or not, some farmers are, are 10 acres per sample and, and on and on. But we're, we stopped at four. Four is a pretty low number of samples, just 12 in this field. So, we got a lot of ways to slice and dice this data, all the different nutrients and ways to analyze it. Just, here's just a quick look at just a potassium map from this farm. So again, that truth layer is the 16th acre grid on the far left. Focus rise all the way to the far right. That's that four acre grid. You just notice how different the representation of values are and the colors of the map. There's zones that don't even appear if your sample density is too low. If you don't have enough samples to represent the field, 
but it still comes in about 65% accurate at representing the field. Uh, not real good. So it's 35% of the field is misrepresented. Next to that, as you move to the left, is the two and a half acre grid map of potassium. And we're up to 68% of the field represented accurately. A slight improvement, but not a big improvement over four acre. And we move to the soil zone uh, sampling method, and now we're at 75% accurate. I'm not real satisfied with any of that. So basically, the check you write for fertilizer, the foundation that we measured to determine how much to put on, we're still only about 60 to 70% accurate in representing the true variability in the field of how much fertilizer needs to be applied. And so I just think, you know, as we work through all of these steps, you need to be thinking about how much you want to rely on the system. So as we slice this data up and look at it in different ways, we also applied fertilizer recommendations to these fields. And uh, this is looking at the four-year phosphorus, potassium, and lime fertilizer rec over spend on fertilizer. So we're only looking at the zones of that field that were misrepresented due to the sampling strategy, and we ended up over applying fertilizer that wasn't necessary. Okay, so on the far right, we've got the four acre grid. There's over $100 an acre on average in that field that we didn't need to spend on fertilizer. Okay, and that sample, if you look below that bar, that's how much it costs to soil sample in that, in that fashion. So four acre grids cost about three bucks an acre to soil sample. Moving to the left, two and a half acre grid, we overspent roughly $80 an acre, costs about five bucks an acre to sample that way. We went to one acre grid pattern. That's very, very dense compared to what most of the country is used to. Um, it only costs about 12 bucks an acre to sample in one acre grids, but we're still overspending $67 an acre in this example. Smart zones, same number of samples as two and a half acre grids, but it takes a little bit more prep work for a soil sampling company to build these. They tend to charge slightly more, so 640 an acre to do the smart zones. And then quarter acre grid, we thought, well, what if? What if we pulled four samples per acre to get higher resolution? Um, that cost $50 an acre to pull that many samples, and we're about $50 per acre overspend on fertilizer in this scenario. So there's kind of a sweet spot with that smart zone um, method of sampling fields where we're about 60 bucks an acre overspend on fertilizer, and we're only $6 an acre uh, to pull that type of sample. That's, that's a good place to be as far as in the future. Maybe you can get yours shifted to that. Why do smart zones or soil zones work better? Well, it's because sound soil science and agronomics is actually being applied in this scenario. I mean, think about it. What is the storage and release control system of nutrients in the soil itself? It's the soil particles. How much clay, how much sand is in that soil? What's the organic matter content of that soil? It drives the mineralization process from microbes. So the total storage and release ecosystem of soil is the, what the soil's made of. So defining those zones and then soil sampling with respect to those soil types is going to improve the representation of the field. And our data is telling us that. It's gotten a lot easier. Precision Planning came out with a smart firmer uh, about five, six years ago. The Smart Firmer was designed to tell you everything you need to know about whether you're putting your seed while you're planting into an optimum environment. It measures soil moisture, soil temperature. It measures how much residue is in the seed furrow that could potentially cause late emergers. But while you're getting all of that good data, it's also giving you a free high resolution organic matter map. And so for just a couple thousand bucks, you can have a few of these on the planter and you can generate free high resolution soil maps that can then be given to your soil sampling service, your agronomy service, and they can build some highly representative zones that would help you do a better job in soil sampling. We'll move to the lab results. We wanted to learn about lab variability. So we picked one of the best labs in the Midwest and we blended a large soil sample in a tub and we were able to fill 160 individual soil sample bags from that large blended sample. Over a 14-day period, we sent a few samples to the lab every day, and then we looked at the results when they came back, and just to give us a, a gauge on what's the reliability of results, here's the, what we got. So pH within a couple of percent of variation. Phosphorus was plus or minus 10%, and potassium, which is known in this industry of soil science to be a very tough one to get our hands around, Potassium was plus or minus 33% from one of the best labs in the Midwest. 
What does that mean in your fertilizer budget on your farm? Well, that means your DAP application would be plus or minus $10 an acre or 40 pounds of DAP, depending on the variation in lab values. And your potassium application would be plus or minus $30 an acre or about 130 pounds of potash on your farm. So if you're at soil test levels where you're only applying about 150 pounds of potash, the reality is you send the same sample to the lab a week later and your potash budget might swing by as much as 50 bucks to $100 an acre. It's kind of crazy how variable that can be. Here's lab to lab accuracy. There is a program called the Agricultural Laboratory Proficiency Program. This is a volunteer group that creates a large composite sample set of samples that has known soil test values, and labs can volunteer to run those samples and submit the results to be put into this report. So any of you can look this up if you want to look at laboratory accuracy and variability across the country. And what they report is a generic number for every lab. They don't tell you which lab is which data point in here, but you can see uh, what the repeatability is lab to lab. So there's 41 labs across the bottom of this chart, and this is a phosphorus uh, report. If every lab generated the exact same results on the soil sample, each of those colored dotted lines would be straight across from left to right. All of the vertical change in dot location, so all you need to focus on is error lab to lab. It's inconsistency of results. There happens to be about 20 part per million plus minus in the phosphorus report from this last summer, and that equates to about a plus minus $90 an acre in DAP on your farm. So I don't know if you're involved at all in choosing what lab you're working with or if you understand um, how much care they take in careful measurements and repeatability and accuracy and clean working environment and good employees that care about attention to detail and whatever else might cause these variables, it might be something you want to look into. So as we move on, there's the recommendation that follows yet. So all we've covered so far is collection of soil and analysis of soil. The recommendations themselves, again, are based on land-grant university research. They kind of build the foundation of the agronomy guidelines for the, the formula to how much fertilizer we apply. This is uh, a two-year fertilizer rec for just P and K on 1,000 acres. And we use the same yield goals of 175 bushel corn and 60 bushel soybeans. We use the same soil test values. One third of the acres out of that thousand is low soil test values, one third medium and one third high soil test values for P and K. And we applied state by state their recommendations. And you can see the total cost in fertilizer on the map up there. And look how different they are. I'll just point out a few of them. There's this crazy border effect. So from Nebraska to Iowa, there's $118,000 difference in your fertilizer investment, depending on which state's recommendations you follow. From Minnesota to Iowa, there's $87,000 difference in, depending on which state's recommendation you follow. Between Wisconsin and Illinois, $84,000. Between Indiana and Illinois, $71,000. 70 dollars to $120,000 difference for two farmers Farming on each side of a state line, similar soils, same yield goals, $100,000 difference in a two-year fertilizer wreck. This is a problem. This is a problem. Our states can't agree on what the right recommendation is based on the same soil test and the same yield goals. And I think it's just really important that you understand how this works. Crop research behind those values. Why are the states different? This is what a data set looks like. It's called a crop calibration uh, uh, test plot or research. And what, what they do is basically it's, it's long-term yield trials and they compare the soil test values to the relative yield of the crop in these trials. It's good work. It's the type of work that needs to be done. But it's pretty hard to pick a sweet spot out of a data set like this. Every point is that yield response to soil test values. And there's some really high yielders all the way to the left on this chart in the low phosphorus values. And there's high yielders all the way to the right, and there's a scatter in between. The problem with this type of research is partly the funding, partly the effort put behind it, partly customers not demanding better data, 
Um, but nationally, there's only been a few hundred trials in the last 40 years. What if the seed and chemical industry only had a few hundred trials in 40 years? Do you think we'd have the products we do today? The seed industry does tens of thousands of trials every year to dial in the genetics that perform the best. And we see the results of that year in, year out as our yields continue to increase from better genetics. Only a few sites within a state have these trials been, been done on. So there's really poor representation of a variety of soil types and the different farming practices within a state. Most of this data is primarily based on broadcasted fertilizer methods. So it's put it all on in the fall, evaluate the soil values, and look at the yield results. There's, there's not much data out there from the universities on what to do if you're banding some nutrients in your, in your fertilizer program. The universities know this, the scientists know this. They know that this isn't perfect. So if you read your agronomy handbook, and I think every farmer should with the amount of money you're investing in fertilizer, they say these are guidelines and they are not recommendations. So it's something to follow, but it's not gospel. It's not truth. And you need to realize that when you're writing these checks, um, how confident are you in this system that's behind it? So the next step is <clears throat> they take this data, it's what they have, um, and that we've got to create some sort of recommendations for the farming community. So statistically, we build a yield curve, the university build a yield curve, and ideally you pick where does it turn flat, right? Where does it stop responding to increasing soil values? And we, the zone is created there called optimum. Um, for phosphorus, it tends to land somewhere around 20 to 30 part per million. Okay, so that's the guideline. And a lot of the agronomists in the fertilizer industry, they realize that this isn't an exact science. So most of the time the recommendation is going to be, let's build two optimum, maybe go a little past for safety, and that's, that's the majority of where your fertilizer programs are designed. <clears throat> so there's a little bit of buffer built into the system naturally. Part of that is, because just like Matt mentioned in the hot dog eating contest, majority of us are putting all of our fertilizer on for P and K in the fall, broadcasted. And this whole system with the recommendations from the universities and the amount of fertilizer we need is built on the idea that we put it all on up front. If we build those soil test levels up high enough, it'll be stored in the, in the bank, the fertilizer bank, the soil bank, and then our crop during the year will get what it needs based on the yield response trials. But what about the guarantee of efficiency and the guarantee of making sure every dollar spent on fertilizer generates yield and generates an ROI? Because less than 10% of that broadcasted P or K is actually getting into that crop that year. Well, this is really kind of a complex situation if you've got cash rent ground, where building the soils up and spending a lot of money on fertilizer to get there is not actually feeding the crop during the same year. It might be four and five years later before some of that fertilizer becomes available. Why is that? How does fertilizer actually get to our plants in the field? And this is all crops. It, all crops rely on the nutrients in solution on any given hour of any given day during the growing season. Like I mentioned earlier, the soil ecosystem itself is what stores and releases those nutrients. So the nutrient release is heavily dependent on the temperature and the moisture cycles that we're going through in a given crop season. It depends on the soil microbe health in that field because that's what mineralizes and breaks down the organic components of nutrients. And it heavily depends on the amount of organic matter and clay in a soil type because that's the size of the storage system. At any one time in soil solution, there's less than 1% of the total nutrients in the soil available to the plant's roots themselves. And so they rely on this pattern of temperature, moisture, and release of nutrients over time. When we put it all out there at once, over 90% of that gets consumed by this ecosystem. It doesn't stay available to the plants all year. And we need to understand that as we think through our system. We've done a lot of research on moving nutrient placement around in the season, moving it to different machine passes, trying to find more optimized ways to guarantee a return on your investment in fertilizer. You see, the one way that you have in control today, we can't necessarily fix the laboratories the university recommendations, the soil sampling methods we can improve on a little bit, but it's still not perfect. One thing we can take control of is to place our nutrients in a way at a time that we can better guarantee plants having access to it. 
So we've generated a couple of products, FurrowJet and Conceal, over the last six years as we've done fertilizer research. And we've seen significant results in improving the ability of better feeding and better utilizing those nutrients. But I'm not just going to talk about starter trials and nitrogen trials where we banded nutrients and we compared it to a check. What I think is more useful, and it's rare to get the opportunity for you guys to do this, is to pull it all together and look at the yield and the economics of a total system approach. So it's not just the decision of do you use starter or not. It's a decision of how do you change your total program to take advantage of some banded nutrients in your system. So five years ago, I created a study I call it the Pursuit of Fertilizer Optimization. There's really no exact guidelines behind this other than I've seen and measured the benefits of nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium applied in bands with the planter close to the row. And so I know that when we do that, we're reducing our dependency on the university and soil testing system. We don't need high soil test levels. So we're going to pull those levels back. So here's an example. We still want some optimum levels in the soil, but rather than building a luxurious amount, like on the phosphorus chart on the left, a lot of your soils are built to 30 part per million. I'm going to change my target to just 20. We're still near the optimum level where that yield curve is at its peak but I'm going to shift farther left because it costs money to broadcast fertilizer to get those soil levels beyond that point. And I know that that's not feeding my crop. And I also have the safety of some of those nutrients being banded with the planter. So that's a key component in the program. The other is banding with the planter. We also put some on with side dress banding, uh, some P and K along with the nitrogen. And we're just going to carry this out over multiple years. So it's basically, uh, we've got three fields wide diversity of fields here. We've got a field with very low fertility levels from the beginning, um, and we've got one with very moderate good levels, and we've got one with high levels. We've got sandy soils under irrigation, we've got muck soils that are over 10% organic matter, and then we've got fields that are 3 to 4% organic matter, just good high productive fields. The first field I'm going to review is the low fertility farm, called our Morton South 19 field. This field started out with four part per million P1 values. Again, that optimum was 20 to 30. 120 part per million potassium values. Um, and the reason why the levels were at that point is the family that owned it, we've been working with for test plot research for quite a while, and they've always told us, you don't want to use this farm. We haven't taken that good care of it. So for a, year, a few years, when we were just doing planter research, we just stayed off this farm. And then it, finally I asked him why. I said, What's, what's wrong with that field? Why don't you want us to use that one? It's a nice 20-acre rectangle field, good one for plots. I said, well, we haven't fertilized it well. We've always assumed we're going to sell it for housing development. Notice the street on the left side there, houses. So we didn't put any PK or lime on it for 25 years. So that land sale for housing development didn't happen as fast as they thought. But I said, no, perfect. This is what we're looking for. So let's learn about what's the best ROI on fertilizer in low soil fertility fields. Is we, we can find high fertility fields all over the place. I like this example because every year I talk to farmers that pick up a new cash rent farm and prior tenants didn't spend money on fertilizer. So they drew the levels down. And the landlord is, is a removed landlord. They're not paying attention to it. So you have these situations all the time in your own operations. This is also representative of individual zones within your fields that are low fertility and how could you get a better ROI with fertilizer. So here's the programs we're running. The broadcast university recommendation programs, because it's low levels, is calling for 400 pounds of MAP, 400 pounds of potash every fall for four years to get these levels built up. That's the investment needed. And then you can see weed and feed nitrogen and side dress nitrogen. In the band min soil build program, where we reduced our soil build target, we're only putting on about 100 to 125 pounds of MAP and, and potash. And then we've got starter. Phosphorus and potassium on with the planter, along with nitrogen banded with the planter using furrow jet and conceal. And then we've got our side dress pass, which is also a great place to spike in a little bit of 10340 and 0012 to get some phosphorus and potassium out there. It reduces the volume load needed on the planter pass uh, to get all that I want to, to band. I tend to try to target about a third of the phosphorus program and just a little bit of potassium in my banded applications. Again, I'm just making this up as I go, knowing that this is one opportunity that you have. 
So here's a look at the cost. This is the average yearly cost for the first four years on this farm. We did corn every year for four years. The Broadcast University rec on the far right, $261 an acre is the investment. In the middle where we reduced the soil build target and we're banding some of the nutrients, we're spending $197 an acre. And then we maintained the no P and K block uh, to compare what the farmer's done there for, or the landowner's done there for the last 25 years. So nitrogen only. This is also what the cheap cash rent guy does uh, when he doesn't want to buy fertilizer. Just nitrogen only on a corn year. So we're only spending $95. So can we make up the difference in yield? Is, is there an ROI spending $166 more per acre? All year long, we can see the results and the health and the growth and the benefits of the banded nutrients. Those banded blocks always stand out. So just like when we would do a specific starter trial, comparing starter versus no starter, in this scenario where we've got the all-in programs designed, we're putting significantly more fertilizer on those broadcast blocks, but yet the planter and side dress banded P and K and nitrogen is really standing out. Corn is a great crop to evaluate fertilizer programs because it's extremely sensitive through all of its stages of development on what resources it has available to each and every plant. We actually speed up the maturity of corn if it's extremely healthy and it's well fed. We slow down the maturity of corn if we put it under stress, if it's lacking nutrients or water or our weather patterns aren't quite right. So when you look at this picture, it, anytime your fields are tasseling, it's a great opportunity to evaluate how good a job you're doing with your system because the goal is all uniform plants, which means all plants maturing at the same time, which means when the tassels come out, they should all pop the same day. Right down the middle is the nitrogen only block lacking phosphorus and potassium. We don't have a single tassel yet in this picture. On the left of the picture, you can see every tassel is out. They're the same height, same size, very uniform. On the far right, 400 pounds of DAP, 400 pounds of potash, and I've got inconsistent tassel development. So the soil has consumed all of that MAP and potash, and we don't have consistency of feeding those plants. And it's telling us that there's, there's a, an opportunity to improve that. Here's the average yield over the four years. 235 on the broadcast program, 238 on the banding program, and just 174 bushels on the nitrogen only program. 60 bushel per acre opportunity to invest in P and K in general on your low testing parts of your fields and your farms. So that's a big, big opportunity right there. Um, and then you notice there's not a big difference, just a few bushels between the banding and the broadcast, but we have significantly different fertilizer investments there, remember? Look at the efficiency on the ROI side. Our banded program did yield more, a few bushels. We spent significantly less, and the overall average for four years is $72 an acre higher profit in a better system for managing fertilizer and investing in fertilizer. And you notice nitrogen only is way behind. You're going to struggle in a nitrogen only program in low fertility fields uh, to pay the cash rent, pay your labor, pay for your equipment. There's not much left there. So this last year we moved it to soybeans. We're going to continue corn soybean rotation on this farm after a while. Not much difference in yield on the soybean between the broadcast high fertilizer rates and the efficient banded rates. We did put starter on the soybeans this last year. And then the nitrogen only, we don't need nitrogen on beans, so it's a no fertilizer pass. So there's 10 bushel opportunity to investing in P and K in a soybean crop when you have low soil testing parts of a field. Um, and then let's look at the ROI, okay? We got similar yields on the broadcast. We're spending significantly more to have high soil build levels with broadcasted fertilizer. $80 an acre increase ROI in the soybean year in the banded program where we're being more efficient with how we place that fertilizer. The next field, I'm going to go through just a little bit quicker. Um, we've got five years of data, corn, soybean rotation the whole time, six replications on this 40-acre plot of just the broadcast program versus the banding program. This is 4% organic matter soils, very high productive. We started out with good soil test levels, 31 part per million phosphorus, 140 on the K. The program looks like this, so about 150 to 200 pounds of MAP and potash, and then the nitrogen and the UAN uh, at side dress time in the corn years. This is an average of the corn and bean years together. Roughly 20 to 50 pounds of MAP and potash, 
um, in the band men's soil build program. We're reducing our, our dependency on just the soil test levels themselves, and then we are banding with the planter and the side dress bar uh, and the corn ears. So here's just the five-year ROI, corn soybean rotation, $38 an acre, uh, better ROI on the banded program. Last field then is the widely variable sandy field under irrigation, 90 acre plot here where we've been uh, multiple replications of the two programs, very high fertility levels at the beginning, 40 part per million on the P1 and over 200 on the K levels. We have so many different zones of variability there that we separate them all every year and we look at them. The green bar on this chart is all you need to focus on. It's the banding program and every zone, regardless of its yield and ROI potential, is always ahead. So the field average for five years, there's corn and soybeans in this data, $53 an acre to the banding program where we're less dependent on high soil test levels. So we pull all those together Pretty wide variety that represents just about everything that you guys in this room farm. And you can see the variation of return on investment, but they're all positive. This is the, the increase in profitability with the banding program across all those fields, all those zones. And the overall average of the three fields for five years is $59 an acre. Now, all of this economic data is based on the price of fertilizer and the price of the grain the, each year that we did the plot. And then we averaged the five years together. And that's the $60 per acre. So you can look at this $60 per acre is the opportunity that we experienced the last five years. What about where we are today and the forecasted pricing going forward? I'm just gonna flash that up there because if you believe that the high prices might stick around a while, if we use the same yield responses and the same plot data, it goes to $99 an acre increased opportunity with investing in a banding fertilizer system compared to a broadcasted system. So Matt's gonna come back up here and just kind of recap some of the key points of, of what we've covered today. Thanks, Corey. And then after that, we might have a little time for questions, but yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll try, we'll try. So that $100, that's based on today's fertilizer, right? So. We're gonna use $59 going forward. So I'm gonna to try to summarize, right? So you kinda of got, you know, Corey, you know, he's the, the lab coat guy, and, and, and then they got me. So I'm gonna go do a summary so everybody understands, all right? So planter fertility is a key component in, a, in achieving higher fertilizer profits. Uh, the three-part system that he just explained to us, he's using a quarter of his nitrogen program and a third of his P program with the spring pass. It's a reallocation, so it's an overall less usage of fertilizer. So all he's doing is pulling from a fall broadcast and using that money to apply it with the planter. We're actually using less. Lower seed, lower uh, your test soil. So what he's saying is, look, you can pull back if you're banding. The overall field fertility doesn't have to be as high if you're going to put it in the zone where it needs to be. All right? Another key thing that we want you guys to take away from this is realize the nutrient measurement, uh, the way we get our recommendations, there's some, some flaws in there. There's some fundamental things that just aren't quite right. I think you guys all know that though, right? There's some gray areas, you know, um, we kind of connect some dots using values here, you know, but I think we kind of already know that. And the other, the big takeaway for me is that more fertilizer doesn't always equal more yield. So I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty neat. You know, they edged you by it. He had to go to the second decimal point, if you guys noticed, on that side-by-side -side with soybeans to come up with a winner, right? So let's kind of take that through. So why planter fertilizer, right? We talked about the easy button. This is not easy. This is hard. This is more work. But why are we going to do it and why we should do it and why we're going to recommend that you should look at it in your operations? $59 an acre, so $59 an acre, it doesn't really mean much. Let's do an example. Let's pretend we have a thousand acre farm, all right? So if we size our planter to do 40 acres per fill, okay? And that means that we have to stop that planter 25 times to fill it with starter in the spring. Now hold on a minute, Matt. I already told you I don't have time for this nonsense, okay? I want you to know, you're probably gonna stop and put fuel in the tractor, seed in the planter, and fuel in the person driving the planter, right? 
that I just went ahead and took all credit for just putting starter on. You guys with me so far? So I'm already fudging the numbers to make this look, it should look better than what I'm gonna show you. That comes up to 12 and a half hours. One full day of running that planter is how much time it's gonna take to put starter on all those acres, all right? So $59 an acre return, five years over every type of soil, low, medium, high. Sand, loam, organic matters, irrigated, all the stuff that Corey came up with, that's $59,000 a year to your operation. You guys ready for this? I found the highest paying job in all agriculture. Are you ready? Uh, you get paid $4,700 and $4,720 to fill that planter in the springtime. Yeah, I don't get paid that. Now, some of you are going to say, now hold on a minute there, guy. You didn't, put, you didn't take anything out for what it's going to cost me to equip. I have to tend it. I have to, put, I have, to have a way to store it. I have to pump it. You know, there's some things you don't have in there. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Take $59,000 out of my example. Go buy whatever you need to do it. Then you're only making $3,700 an hour filling the planter. Okay? It's a big deal. We know it's there. Find it. Try it. Okay, now this got brought up to me not too long ago, and uh, it, this was a general conversation between Corey and myself, really not even anything to do with this presentation, and I realized that it doesn't matter how valuable you are if you're not available to somebody, all right, so God put that on my heart, somebody needed my help, and I could have helped them, but I couldn't, I was unavailable to them, you know what that made me to them, kind of worthless, and you know what Corey said? Corey said, the best fertilizer management system in the world isn't valuable if you can't implement it. What we just laid out is hard. It's going to be more work, right? You're going to have to figure out a way. Here's the good news. You guys spray, right? You already tend to sprayer. You can probably figure out a way to tend the planter, all right? I'm going to have Corey come back up here. We're going to have time for about two or three questions, and... Uh, I appreciate your time so much, and uh, let's see if, we, if there's any of those that got in there. We got a little bit of time here. 